Impact Hustlers, the podcast on entrepreneurs and change makers that are creating solutions to the world's biggest problems. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact. And this is your host, Michael Shafrat. In today's episode, I talk to Danny Witcher, co-founder of Work for Good. Work for Good is on a mission to help companies donate to the causes they care about. A lot of organizations want to give more, but often the day-to-day of the business comes in the way. Work for Good hopes to solve this problem by making the giving process as seamless as possible. It's great to have you on the show, Danny. Uh, Thank you. It's great to be on the show. I've been listening to some of your previous podcasts, some really cool people. Thanks for joining as another cool person to have on the show. It's really great to see what you're doing. And my first question is actually around what's the biggest friction for companies that are trying to give, they try to donate, but what stops them from doing this? Oh, that's a nasty one to start with, because it sounds like there should be one answer to that. The reality is it's multiple things. Uh, We're particularly focused on the SME world. We think smaller businesses don't have dedicated CSR resources, department infrastructure. So therefore, it's always, you know, a time, a priority of 15 other urgent things that have to happen as a small business owner. That's pretty big, but there are tax and legal problems, um, all sorts of stuff, probably too much detail to go into on a first question. But there are an array of real world issues that get between intent and action. Mm -hmm. And how do you simplify that? What's the solution? What does it work like if I'm a small business that wants to donate to causes? Sure. I guess the course of the, the, the philosophy is to make business giving easy and compelling. So compelling, which is the more fun stuff to talk about, is if you're going to give to charity, embed it into your day-to-day, do it in smart ways that drive positive business outcomes that are good for your business at the same time as good for cause. That's what makes giving kind of symbiotic, makes it sustainable. So we advise and design giving strategies, uh, and we can talk about some specific examples, um, and then help businesses to tell their giving story. So particularly in the UK, move them away from the Britishness of not wanting to talk about your good works because it's vulgar and people don't like showing off. And actually saying, no, talk about it with pride and authenticity or differentiate your business and hopefully also inspire and engage other business owners to do the same. So that's the compelling bit. The easy bit is all the boring, perfunctory stuff. It's pay tech integrations. It's legal and tax solutions. And that sounds really boring, but it's very important. Currently, there are some big impediments to smaller businesses who want to give to charity. People like WaterAid, Friends of the Earth, they used to turn away kind of five businesses a week that approach them wanting to give them money because they're not big enough and a range of other kind of reasons. So we've created a digital solution to those tax and legal issues, which means somebody can sign up to our platform in two minutes and start linking donations to sales of goods and services in tiny amounts, whereas typically a charity might want a minimum £25,000 a year, below which they're unable to negotiate all the docs that are required as a matter of policy. So we've made all the kind of perfunctory stuff easy. A a Work for Good business member has an online account from which they can settle up giving pledges and a few little clicks to multiple charities, keep all of their tax deductible receipts in one place. We've created this tax and legal solution to the behavior, et cetera. So we've just made the doing very easy. And then hopefully we help them to do it in a way that is good for business too. Mm. And that's also a communications tool to some degree, right? So for this podcast, actually, we work with somebody that edits our show and even before I got in touch with you, I received an email. Hey, he just donated some money on your behalf because you're a customer and it goes to actually a charity for hearing loss. So that was really interesting. I never got an email like this before that a company had donated on my behalf. So it became a communications tool as well to say, hey, look, we're doing this great work. And I'm sure there's some benefits for the companies that do this. Yeah, I mean, the thing we've uniquely made possible for smaller businesses has a label. I I don't particularly like it, but it's called cause marketing. And it is that thing at its most commercial. You're linking what you do to a named charity and you're benefiting from the kind of halo effect of that. And, you know, we live in this meta trend of purpose in business. All stakeholders look for and value companies that are the good guys. It drives employee behavior, motivation, loyalty. It drives customer and client satisfaction and choice. 
So, and for a smaller business, actually, you know, it's a very simple way of doing it. You know, on every invoice, we'll give back 3% and we'll quantify invoice by invoice how many acres of rainforest have been preserved because you worked with us rather than the next guys. You know, to give some other examples to bring it to life, we have a restaurant. The thing we designed for them is we worked out how much they wanted to give in a year, how much they were already giving and say, well, put it into your business. Why don't you take one table, call it your charity table, put up a big poster above it, talking about your values, why you want to give back to the community and how it works. And how it works is they give away the profit from every meal at that one table to cause, but they let their diners choose from a list of eight charities as to which cause benefits because of their custom. And it's really smart engagement. And they get lots of word of mouth referrals and they've had lots of free PR and local press because it's innovative. And it's that kind of thinking, embed charitable giving in smart ways, visible ways, that is to a degree marketing. You know, the majority of the people on the platform, it comes from the heart as well. Well, we do have a few who are quite honest who say, I actually don't care about charity. I just think this is good for business. So uh, you know, we don't really mind. There's a whole spectrum. As long as it's generating additive philanthropic funding, that, that's our mission. Amazing. So it's good for companies. It's good for the charities that you work with. How is this good for you? How's the business model for you? How do you make money with this? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, originally, the plan was to be a charity, not charge anybody anything. And then having taken a lot of enlightened um, uh, thinking on the subject, we worked out we're going to do more good if we set up profit with purpose. And we have a revenue model. It's going to cost us a lot of money to even get to break even. So this isn't a get rich scheme, but um, very much our intention is to be able to run this sustainably at scale. And for that, we have two parts. We charge businesses what we think is a relatively token annual membership subscription. It's based on the size of the company in terms of number of employees. It starts from as little as £25 a year for a sole trader. We also deduct from the charity flows 5% to further fund the work. And that is the revenue model. Like I said, it's a long time until it gets to a profitable revenue model, but that's the thinking. Yeah. What led you to decide in the end to set it up as a for-profit? You said there was a bit of a thought process of debating between a non-profit, for-profit. Yeah, I guess, I guess two parts. The early thinking was what will give us the operational flexibility and freedom to fund this and drive it to scale. And that's pretty much what drove the decision. I then went through a slightly longer journey of getting from uncomfortable to very comfortable around the concept of wanting to be the next Just Giving that there's an exit. Investors make money. Rupert and myself, my co-founder, we didn't get in to make money. We've pledged 70% of the founder's equity to cause when there's a monetization. Um, so that wasn't our personal motivation. But actually creating more impact investment success stories could be a hugely powerful thing ultimately for social good because it's going to attract a bigger slice of the reward-seeking trillions of assets around the world into the social impact space if they can do good and create a return. So it's an interesting one because there is a lot of unenlightened thinking out there. We've come across charities who've seen we're advertising to hire somebody with a salary and have taken real offense that in the charity space we could pay somebody to work. So, you know, there's a whole spectrum of thinking out there and uh, we have to be careful with that narrative, but that was our thinking in those choices. I think it's always an interesting debate. I actually, in my high school times, I used to work as a side job as a charity fundraiser. So on the street, basically one of these annoying people. Chuckle, I think is the, is the term <laughs> you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, working for WWF. And obviously there has been a lot of criticism because at least when I did it in Germany, these people were paid quite well. If we did well, we got paid very well. But I think in the long run, I really got the opinion that, you know, the cake can actually grow quite a bit through for-profit businesses that try to make charities more money. There might be always cases where abuse happens, but it's great to see, I think, in terms of your business model that, you know, the more you grow, actually, the more the charities and the causes will actually benefit. So that's great to see. Yeah. And we love WWF as well. They're, uh, they've only been on the platform two or three months and they're sending us lots of business and they really get it and we're adding value to them. It's just crazy that in the UK, certainly, you know, all these brands get approached every day of the week by businesses trying to give them money and, and can't handle it. And just by way of background, I mean, this is a stat I like to get out there on these conversations. Of the 20 odd billion pounds that goes to charity in the UK each year, a miserable 2% comes from businesses currently. It's tiny. I just find that shocking. Individuals give 47%. So people like you and I reaching into our pockets to support something or someone we care about is 20 times bigger in absolute terms than the amount of cash the businesses give to charity. And that's where we really want to move the needle on. We think the sort of backdrop is incredibly receptive. There's this kind of powerful win-win available where businesses can embed charitable giving and drive business growth and charities get the funding. But it's not a behavior that's adopted on a universal basis at all. Mm. So you deal a lot with behavior change for businesses as well, trying to convince them 
of the mission to basically get a higher share of GDP donated to charities, right? Donate a percentage of your revenue, percentage of a table in your restaurant. Yeah. So we've created, you know, a huge mountain for ourselves to climb. Well, we haven't created it. It was there in the first place. But behavior change, I'm sure you know, isn't easy. So every time we talk to a small business owner, I would say literally 19 out of 20 conversations go really, really well admittedly, there's then a user journey, a disconnect between liking the concept and actually getting on and doing it well. Um, so that, you know, we have some work in our, our business around that. But as a concept, people get it, but that's not how people start thinking until we talk to them. So we have a massive marketing and education piece to our mission. Hmm. When you first started out with the idea, and you mentioned that this is obviously a long term goal to kind of build a profitable business out of this, did you raise investment from impact investors? Or how did you kind of first start out and make sure that you could cover costs? Yeah, absolutely. I put in the first uh, little slice. And then we continue to be powered by angels. We've done uh, three kind of SEIS, SEIS rounds, uh, issuing equity. And that's got us to this point. We're currently doing another round to drive the next wave of growth and scaling. And we really need to invest in tech and integrations and bigger marketing. We've been very shy on marketing spend uh, and people, of course. So we're doing quite a significant round now. And so any listeners out there looking for interesting in impact investment ideas to back, by all means, get in touch. So you're now a later seed round or a series A round or what are you preparing for? Uh, yeah, seed still, I think. Yeah. We've kind of done it slightly piecemeal, but it's still seed. Yeah, amazing. Tell us a bit more about a story from maybe one of your customers, a good story that you told me the story of the restaurant. But what's a good example of a typical customer that maybe didn't give to charity before or didn't give as much and through your service was actually able to bring it to a next level and have a tangible impact? Is there something that you can share? Sure, I can talk about a couple of examples. I suppose it's worth talking about, you know, we mentioned external customer facing stuff. So let me just start. There's an interesting recruitment example, which is more about, you know, I went into the speech, see these people, I said, oh, you can impress your customers and da da da. And they said, we don't care. Um, what we are really worried about is we have 60 millennial salespeople in various sales teams focused on different sectors. And we'd really might like to make some sort of charitable pledge kind of publicly. By publicly, they mean internally you know, that motivates our guys and what we came up with because uh, they were a little bit nervous about pledging cash donations in quite a cyclical business. They said, listen, if we hit or outperform targets, absolutely, we can afford to give money away. So we'll make a pledge at the beginning of the year. We'll give a slice of the outperformance to cause and then we're going to tell all the staff about it. So they know the business is committed and the staff are there trying to keep their jobs and get paid commission, but also kind of serving this higher purpose that if the business is successful on the back of their efforts, cause will benefit. And that really obviously works for millennial generations. And then we had some fun with it. We said, tell you what, why don't we gamify the whole thing too? So firstly, you want to engage your staff by letting them choose which charity it goes to. Uh, and that's something important in the way we design a lot of these giving schemes is if you want to engage stakeholders with your giving, then let them choose the charity because charity is so incredibly personal. So let each sales team choose a different charity at the end of the year and then get the competitive juices flowing by saying the charity pie will be divided into different size slices and the more successful teams get to give away the bigger bits. And then you get the kind of competitive thing between the sales teams as well as the we're doing good kind of imperative. So stuff like that works really well. Another example, I guess, right, to the kind of more micro business. We have a lot of sole traders on the platform. We've made it that easy to embed charitable giving. And uh, there's one lady who makes sort of amazing, beautiful little uh, children toys. She was, again, I think came to us through World Wildlife Fund. And she says she's doubled her sales since she put in a 10% pledge. 10% of sales goes to World Wildlife Fund. She talks about it in her collateral, on her market stalls, et cetera, et cetera. And she said it's just been a complete fillip to sort of boosting sales. You know, it makes her feel good too. It makes her customers feel good too. And it just kind of works. Mm, amazing. Everybody wins in that model, right? When you first started out, I think your co-founder Rupert had quite a personal story why he started the business and then you joined just shortly after the idea was formed. That's right. What motivated you and Rupert to start everything and why did you join on this mission? What was it the kind of itch that you responded to there? Yeah, sure. I guess let's tell Rupert's story first. So it was his idea. So basically, Rupert has his eldest daughter has two very rare genetic diseases. She's got a, a bad heart and brittle bones. And she's had something horrible, like 17 major surgeries before the age of five. Uh, and Rupert was understandably thinking how any parent would think, how can I do something good? How can I raise some funds for the Evelina Children's Hospital where who have you know, saved her life on so many occasions? And he was thinking, I'm just too busy. I can't spend six months getting fit enough to run another marathon, to nag my friends and family, to contribute to this cause I care about yet again. And at that moment, he got approached by a client and they said, would you mind running a one-day workshop for a bunch of senior managers? We need to do it quickly. 
And he normally would have said no because he's hugely busy at the time. And he said, tell you what, I'll squeeze it in, but I'll give the £2,000 to the Evelina Hospital. And kind of three cool things happened. One, he went, that was a lot easier than running a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, his relationship with the client was hugely improved in terms of just going to this values level because they were so impressed about, you know, what had just happened. And thirdly, his team at work were extra motivated because they're kind of serving this higher purpose at the same time as doing their job professionally. That was his light bulb moment. Why don't more businesses embed charitable giving into what they do as an efficient way to raise funds for cause? Because you're kind of doing what you're best at. You're monetizing your expertise. But also, if done well, it's kind of you know, good for business because it engages your stakeholders. So that was his story. I then met him, my story, very briefly. Did 25 years of investment banking. No, it was a great career. I won't disrespect it. I never really loved it, though, if I'm honest. And I met Rupert towards the end, and he was looking for advice as to how to set this thing up and how to fund it and everything else. And I exited investment banking four years ago for a number of personal reasons, one of which is I wanted to take all of my energies into doing good because I'd spent several years kind of juggling both worlds at Deutsche Bank. I chaired the charities committee. I got involved in some of the programs we sponsored, mentoring social entrepreneurs, finding myself spending the day in prison training people out of make a better future for themselves. And I was getting all my personal growth from that kind of cool stuff. So I left banking and then I kept in touch with Rupert and I realized that between the business he runs and his three young kids, he had no bandwidth. And I just thought this was too powerful a concept to leave in a drawer gathering dust. So I told him I'd get it started. And I thought, uh, you know, I thought I'd give it six months of my life pro bono. And uh, as I'm sure any other founder will laugh about, three and a half years later, I'm still unpaid. And it's been an amazing journey. Amazing. Well, tell me about some of your achievements in the last three and a half years. And then maybe lastly, we'll move on to the future plans. But first of all, how has that journey been the last few years? Wow. Um, where to start? Let's start on the positives. Um, we have probably 750, 800 registered business and charities on there. We are uh, very established on the charity side. We've got two thirds of the top 20 brands. We never thought charities would be part of the distribution story in the early days, but actually they really are starting to sort of kick off for us, which is great. Of course, whilst they're the beneficiaries of the kind of cash flow, businesses are a key stakeholder in terms of the harder side of the kind of value exchange. And there it's been a more challenging journey. You know, I think I alluded to it earlier. Everyone likes the idea, but particularly for smaller business owners, taking them through that journey from concept to how is it actually going to work within their business model and getting them to embed it and then make it continuous has had some challenges. So we're just doing a bunch of core research at the moment to understand some of that stuff better. We know what some of the issues are. And, you know, it, particularly in terms of just making it effortless, once somebody's made the decision, they're going to give, they're going to promote this product line by doing X thing, or they're going to give Y% of every invoice back or every time. Referrals is something people use commercially a lot to say, because a lot of businesses do really well in terms of their growth by existing users referring other people. And using a charity kicker, a charity pledge to do that, seems to work more powerfully than just saying you'll give somebody money or a discount or something. So just saying, if you refer somebody to me, you know, I'll give £100 to a charity of your choice. Mm. And I think I came across some studies in the past that even studies have shown that people are often more motivated by such pledges for where you promise to give to somebody else and not necessarily they receive some bonus points or some money as a reward for referring somebody, but they know it will benefit a good cause. Is that what you found as well? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, long story short, back to your thing. We know we need to make the tech more integrated. So currently, it's very easy. It takes 20 seconds to create what's known as a commercial participation agreement between you and any charity, however big, without having to promise them £100,000 digitally, without you know even having to approach them. So it's easy, but we don't have integrations. We don't have sort of open APIs, plugs in, plugins into online B2C commerce. We're going to be doing accounting software integrations as well with people like Xero, et cetera, who are very keen on what we're doing. But that stuff all takes time and money. And we're a small team and there are a lot of other sort of uh, fires to fight. So when we can have those integrations, a business owner makes a decision and then all the cash flows happen automatically, all the accounting software things happen automatically, then it's going to be much more integrated, continuous. And also we need to establish our brand, you know, our, our logo. Everyone loves it. The kind of paperclip folders the heart. Everyone comments on it and really likes it. Whilst it's not universally recognized, Businesses are wearing it digitally and physically to try to tell their giving story, but it'll be much better when it's more universally recognized. And frankly, when we have a bigger community, a bigger tribe, because again, people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And thus far, possibly back to our lack of marketing spend and other things, we haven't yet created that profile. And I can't wait for us to do that. Mm -hmm. With that, let's talk about the next 10 years. If you think about the next 10 years of your business, how does the world look like a world where you succeeded as a business? How does the world look like in 10 years if you succeed? I think it'd be fun. You know, we move that 2% to something very different and create a massive additive channel of philanthropic funding. 
it becomes the expectation, the default, that business is about more than profit. And they are very transparent and explicit as to what their give back is. And, you know, because some people don't think giving cash isn't the right way to give, but actually it is very transparent <laughs> and very simple as well. So that becomes the default. You know, one obvious iteration for us is to develop into a marketplace for services and goods, of course, where somebody wants to find an accountant or something commoditized or even not. They want to do it with one of the good guys. They want to do it with a work for good business. So that kind of mark, that kind of accreditation creates in a marketplace where consumer preferences drive business behavior. So those kind of things, you know, there are other also interpretations around what we're doing. There's some applications in the big cap world as well, which we're excited about, but we can't do all things at once. And of course, geographical expansion. We protected the trademark in the US and pan EU, oh, whatever that's going to be worth in a couple of months. <laughs> and uh, clearly, you know, we need to walk before we run, but we'd like to, uh, we'd like to go wider. Oh, yeah, well, thanks very much for joining today. It's inspiring to hear your journey and I wish you all the best for the future. Thanks for being here. Likewise, me. massive thanks to you. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Michael. Bye. This was Impact Hustlers. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact. 